He is perhaps America's most notorious serial killer and sex offender, known for enticing his victims to his home, plying them with alcohol, then killing, sexually assaulting, dismembering, and finally eating them. The scene of his capture was described as more of a sick museum than a crime scene, with human skulls and organs in the refrigerator and freezer, torsos dissolving in acid-filled barrels, and Polaroid pictures of his victims in bizarre poses in various stages of dismemberment. Jeffrey Dahmer was killed in prison in 1994, but everyone is once again talking about him because of the new Netflix series, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story. But way before Netflix, America saw Dahmer right here on Court TV. I know how much harm I have caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. Tonight, we take a look at what actually happened at Dahmer's trial and take you inside the mind of this notorious killer. I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. It's going to be a pretty intense hour ahead of us here. Um, you know, through the years here in the United States, there have been many, many notorious criminals. And when we talk about these notorious criminals, oftentimes these are criminals that become larger than life for whatever reason, even though they deal in the world of death and crime. And they're criminals who are talked about, become in some sick way legendary. And whether it's us in the media here doing stories about what actually happened or whether there are um, adaptations of the stories that are done in movies and series and articles, et cetera, um, these notorious criminals um, take on this, this persona and you try to put some perspective on, on who they are, but oftentimes what happens is they become almost a caricature of, of, of the crimes that they committed and the, the absolute devastation that they left behind. Now, for me, when I think of like the first criminal uh, that kind of fit this mold, for me, it was Jesse James, right? I'm, I'm growing up as a kid, back in the Old West. And think about it, if you say Jesse James, um, still today, you, you listen to some song lyrics, he'll be referenced, and people kind of use it in a way that might be playful. But, it, I mean, he was a criminal. Uh, may not have been a serial killer, may not have been... Um, as devastating as other notorious criminals, but nonetheless, he was robbing, he was a gunslinger, all of that. But, you know, in a certain way, because of the notoriety that he achieved through the years, there's like a softening of, you know, how bad of a criminal was Jesse James actually. Like, I'm like Jesse James, right? And it, and it happens. He's from the Old West. Um, how about the real Scarface? I'm talking about Al Capone. Right? You know, even his name, you know, referenced very casually uh, many times. But you think about, you know, what he did. He had prohibition. He was bootlegging and all that. But he was a big-time mobster, which means you are, like, ordering hits and the murder of many, many people and, and devastating families. I mean, that, that was part of what he was. But when you say the name Al Capone, it's been so many years it's like, okay, yeah, Al Capone, yeah, he was that tough guy from Chicago, right? Yeah, he was the one that was making booze when everybody else, you know, uh, when it was illegal. Then you get to Charles Manson. And I, I think things may change a little bit there. I don't think there's been a softening about him, but maybe a little bit. Um, this is a guy who we covered here on Court TV every time he had a parole hearing. And he would show up. We would, we would cover those hearings. And he was more of a, a, a cult leader, a different type of notorious criminal, but someone who seemed to control people. And, and, and by the same uh, account, there have been movies, there, and obviously we've covered him, there have been series, there have been interviews um, about him. I think for Charles Manson, though, it's a little less of the softening of the edges, probably because it's a little more recent for, for, for people. 
Um, I think people like my age, as a child, remember how evil and how scary he was and how horrific those crimes were that he ordered. Um, so, but we'll see, you know, 20, 30 years from now, are people going to casually talk about Charles Manson? Of all these notorious criminals, though, probably the, the, the sickest, Jeffrey Dahmer. And you say Dahmer, you think of, oh, yeah, the, the, the cannibal guy, right? And to me, that's almost a softening of how horrible a person he was and how much he made his victims suffer. And, you know, you kind of get that brush stroke where maybe you don't know a lot about him. But you kind of get the headline, right? Oh, Jeffrey, yeah, he's a Dahmer. And anytime we cover a story involving an allegation of, of cannibalism, uh, the name Dahmer will come up. But it was, it was, it was much sicker than just that. Like, as, as sick as that is, what he did and how he did it, um, much, much worse. And now you've got this new Netflix drama series, Dahmer, Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story, uh, broke worldwide streaming records when it debuted last week. Ten-episode dramatization reached the most-watched new series in its first week. This is according to IndieWire. But even with the record-breaking view, the show has faced some backlash. Some family members of, of the real-life victims have been outspoken, stating they wish they would have been contacted about the production. What do you do in there? The smells? going all hours of the night. I hear screaming coming from your apartment. I'll just try and say I'm sorry. Is she going to open your gift? Eat it now. Absolutely chill. I mean, everyone is talking about it. People are watching it. And obviously, the victims' families are in a completely different place than everyone else uh, when it comes to this. But it's, it's, it's devastating. But I think the one thing this series is doing is once again revisiting, you know, this completely sick mind of Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, we at Court TV, we covered his trial. Um, it was just before I joined the network. Um, so I wasn't there at this case. But when I got to Court TV, I remember everyone talking about it a lot. It had that sort of impact, the, the reality of what he did. And in this next hour, we're going to talk about that, the reality of what he did, and show you some of the um, clips from his actual trial and talk to folks who've been in the courtroom with Jeffrey Dahmer um, and, and know a lot about what happened here. We'll try to figure out a little bit more about what's going on inside of his mind. And let's start, though, with Jeffrey Dahmer himself in court. Now, he had a trial, he was sentenced, and you know, like every criminal defendant, has an opportunity to speak. And it was a tense moment. Incredible. Like, what is this man going to say? He's just been convicted of these horrific crimes in what he's done. Let's take a listen. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me. I know society will never be able to forgive me. I know the families of the victims will never be able to forgive me for what I have done. I promise I will pray each day to ask for their forgiveness when the hurt goes away, if ever. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. I am so very sorry. Your Honor, I know that you are about to sentence me. I ask for no consideration. I want you to know that I have been treated perfectly by the deputies who have been in your court and the deputies who work the jail. The deputies have treated me very professionally, and I want everyone to know that. They, they have not given me special treatment. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, 
the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive an eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. Thank you, Your Honor, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. That was in his first trial, and he, he pleaded guilty, but then there was the second part of the trial, which was the responsibility portion. Not the sentencing, but the responsibility because he was pleading insanity. And in Wisconsin, they break it into two pieces. He admitted to all the killings in the first trial, but then in the second part, they were contesting whether or not he was legally insane. Jury didn't think so, obviously. And you listen to him there, and I mean, he makes a lot of sense. It seems like he understands everything. Um, and you wonder how someone who could speak like that, right, could do what he actually did. And that's part of what we're going to try to figure out here in the next hour. Um, let me bring in my guests. Joining me tonight in Akron, Ohio, radio news reporter who covered Dahmer's trial for the murder of Steve Hicks. This was the second trial, but actually uh, an earlier victim. Joyce Johnson is with us. And retired TV reporter Don Olson is also with us. He was present for Dahmer's Ohio trial and was present for the dig on Dahmer's property. Joining us also in New York City, psychotherapist and host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Great to see everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Thank you. you know, this is a topic not easy, but um, I think all of you have uh, a perspective that's important tonight. Dr. Robbie Lud Ludwig, I just want to start with you and your reaction to what we just heard from Dahmer at his sentencing all these years later. Um, yeah. What struck you about what he said uh, in that moment? Well, as you can see, there was a composure there, and he seemed to be extremely aware of what he had done and that he was wrong and that he would not be forgiven for the extremity of his uh, crimes and how unusual they were. So it was interesting to see that, and yet we know from some of the psychiatrists who had evaluated him that he appeared to be psychotic at times and paranoid and had a whole list of character disorders that contributed to some of his behaviors. But I think the most striking is that there was a timidity there and an understanding of the evilness of his actions. Joyce, let me start with you. Um, take us there now. The, the trial you're at, is for his first victim in Ohio, right? And but it's a but it's a that's correct. But he's already been convicted, and everyone had, everyone knew about the atrocities and what he had done. Take us to that courtroom. What was it like? What when you think back, um, what what kind of sticks in your mind about that 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 point in time? Amazingly, it was how brief it actually went. Uh, Dahmer had already been sentenced to 15 life terms when he was in Wisconsin, and he pleaded guilty to a charge of aggravated murder in the death of Stephen Hicks, who was his first victim. He was uh, known as the hitchhiker. Uh, now, Hicks uh, was on his way to a concert, was offered beer, uh, was offered a little party, and then Dahmer had promised he would take him to the concert. Of course, that did not happen. And Summit County Common Police Judge James R. Williams sentenced Dahmer to another life sentence after hearing the statements from the family members. Uh, and the sentence was to run consecutively with the time that Dahmer served in Wisconsin. Uh, he was asked his plea to the first count and Dahmer just simply said, guilty as charged, your honor. Uh, he did not make a statement. And his attorney, and one of, he had several attorneys, but one of his attorneys said that he was indeed remorseful, especially in this particular case, because it was his first victim, uh, and even said that he was very nervous about coming back to Ohio because of how he felt about this case. Uh, his attorney said that, you know, he felt he didn't make a statement because he had said everything he wanted to say while he was in court in Milwaukee. So the actual court 
room version was extremely short and we were kept in a side room uh, where we were viewing it. He was let in and he was actually in Ohio a very short amount of time. Uh, he was processed into the state's prison system at Lorraine Correctional Institution in Grafton later that day. Uh, and after the processing, he was returned to Wisconsin. Don, how about this dig site? Hmm. Describe for us uh, what was going on there, who showed up, and, and what it was like, what that atmosphere sure. was like. Well, uh, Dahmer was from Bath Township, which is a uh, rural, upscale suburb of Akron. And uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is the media circus that was there that, that week. It, uh, I think the dig, you know, the excavation of his yard uh, took about four days. And there were uh, live trucks, satellite trucks back then, all the way down the road, I'd say about a quarter of a mile down the road and around the corner. Um, there was media there from Pittsburgh to Chicago, uh, to all of the uh, cable networks, the broadcast networks. Um, and as the week went on, it just, it just I don't know, it became worse. Um, and the, there was even a, a lemonade stand that was set up by some of the kids in the neighborhood. So you can imagine how the Hicks family felt about watching this day in and day out and then seeing this media circus all around the tragic death of their son. Joyce Johnson, Don Olson staying with us. Dr. Robbie Ludwig staying with us as well. When we come back, uh, more involving uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. We're taking a whole hour for it tonight. Plus, coming up in our next... In Waukesha, Wisconsin, the next live trial here on Court TV, the accused Christmas parade killer, Daryl Brooks, set to stand trial, accused of murdering six and injuring 62 others after crashing his SUV into the parade route. We are live from Wisconsin. I wanted to help Daryl. I knew that he was not mentally capable of presenting himself as his own attorney. Love triangle with a tragic ending. Nikki Ensel is accused of killing her husband. Her boyfriend pled guilty for his part. Now she's facing a jury and life in prison if convicted. The cheating wife murder trial. Weekday mornings only on Court TV. The families of Sandy Hook school shooting victims seeking damages against InfoWars founder Alex Jones. The Alex Jones defamation trial. Live coverage continues Tuesday on Court TV and streaming gavel to gavel on Court TV apps and Court Advil Dual Access. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, mother. You know, in all my years of covering murder trials, I've covered so many of them. Um, that's Rita Isabel, and she brought out the, the real impact. You know, we hear about victim impact statements all the time, but I mean, anytime I've seen that, listen to it, I'm just watching it again, it, it, it demonstrates, I believe, the, the real impact that these cases, these crimes, these awful, awful people have on the lives of so many. Let me bring back in my guests. Uh, Joyce Johnson, Don Olson are with us. Uh, they covered one of Jeffrey Dahmer's trials. Dr. Robbie Ludwig with us. Dr. Robbie, um, you know, it's difficult to watch that. I, I do, though, 
watch it every once in a while to remind myself. You know, don't get lost in like, oh, the evidence, the this, the that. Like, all these cases, all these murders are about real people, real impact. And um, I think what Rita expressed there, I think, is, is part of what every victim feels in, in, in some mm -hmm. respect. No, it was very powerful to see that kind of reaction. And I think it's very painful for outsiders or people to think about the victims because it's so painful and it leaves us all feeling vulnerable because we know that this can happen to anyone at any time. And nobody wants to feel that vulnerable to um, you know, criminals, especially very disturbed ones. And, you know, this is being revisited with the new uh, series that's out that also makes Jeffrey Dahmer look a little bit more sympathetic. So you can imagine that adds insult to injury, presenting this man who is clearly um, very troubled and dangerous in this way that's a little sympathetic. Um, but I think it's a good reminder that the families never forget what happens and will live with this every day of their lives. And Joyce, at that second trial for the family of, of Steve Hicks, what was that experience like for them? And did they have that same sort of opportunity to directly address Jeffrey Dahmer or did they have to speak to, sometimes you have to speak to the judge uh, you know, in this case, there was an opportunity to speak directly to Dahmer. Well, they have the opportunity, and it's interesting because one of the things, and, and many of us ask, why bring him here again? You know, he's already been sentenced to 15 life terms in Wisconsin, but then we realized it's going to give the relatives a chance to express their feelings. Uh, that was one of the reasons that he was brought back to Ohio, according to some county prosecutor, Lynn Slaby at the time. Uh, and his mother, uh, Martha Hicks, uh, was very vehemently wanting him to go to the electric chair. Uh, she said she, she wants him to die. He was an animal. Uh, she wanted him to serve 800 years, uh, whatever it took. Uh, but Ohio, although they have a death penalty now, the statute was not in effect at the time of Hick's death. But she was able to describe her son, which she did very tenderly. His smile, she would say, would keep him out of trouble. Uh, and of course, never imagining that he would meet someone. And she described Dahmer as an absolute monster. Uh, but it gave the family the chance that they, they didn't have before. So the family of another. Yeah, at that, uh, Go ahead, Don. I'm sorry, Vinny. Uh, at that uh, statement that Martha Hicks gave at the sentencing, uh, she said that she considered herself a religious person, but she did believe in the death penalty. And as Joyce just said, we did not have a death penalty in 1978 when Stephen Hicks was killed. But she said if we did, that she would have liked to have flipped the switch herself. Well, he, he did get sort of a death penalty. Uh, he was not incarcerated that yes, long. Yes, he did. 1994, uh, right. he was killed. Uh, Conorak uh, Synthas Mafone, uh, difficult last name to pronounce, one of his other victims. Um, his family, he was only 14 years old when he was killed, just 14 years old. His family um, brought a civil suit against uh, police based upon what happened. He had actually escaped partially, but then Dahmer was able to talk police out of um, doing anything and, and brought him back and then murdered him. But in that case, Jeffrey Dahmer um, had to testify for a civil deposition. Let's take a listen to some of that. Well, what you told the police and what you told the psychiatrists in rather lurid detail is that your objective was to gain control of these people. Is that true? That was part of it. Was there anything else involved other than your asserting control over the victim? There may have been, but I, I can't remember right now. Now you did some very specific and rather unusual things to gain and exert that control, such as the use of sleeping medication, 
and also the use of a drilling technique to put them in the zombie type of state. And both of those things were involved in your encounter with Connor. Right. Right, let me talk about those for just a minute. You had a practice of mixing coffee with rum and then adding a sleeping medication by the name of Helicon. Was that your practice? Right. And you did that with Connor? Yes. Now what dosage of Helicon did you administer to Connor? I don't remember. More than one pill. Much different look at Dahmer there than we saw with the little apology in the criminal case in that civil deposition. Um, we're out of time for this segment. Big thank you to Joyce Johnson and Don Olson. Appreciate you on today. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, always great to have you on as well. Thank you. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue our hour as we take another look at Jeffrey Dahmer with some more of the original footage from his trial right here on Court TV. set of questions is pointed at why these events extended beyond the homosexual and got into the situation where you actually took the lives of your victims. And yeah, I think, I'd like to know the reason for that too. I don't know. That's Jeffrey Dahmer and in a civil case where um, not he was being sued, but the, the city was being sued, and he was one of the witnesses and had to answer questions under oath. You look at him there, looks much different than he did in his criminal case. And I think you have a, almost a better realistic look at who Jeffrey Dahmer was. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this hour we're taking a look at, at Jeffrey Dahmer because here at Court TV covered his actual trial. Let's take a listen to what um, his defense attorneys had to say in their opening statement, again, this trial was cut into two pieces. Uh, the first piece of, of, of the trial was, did he commit the murders? And he admitted to it and pleaded guilty. The second part was responsibility, which meant his mental state. Was he responsible legally for those murders or was he legally insane? Let's take a look. It was while he was in high school that this fantasy of his, doing things with dead things, started showing up when in a biology class he dissected a baby pig and took the, the head home with him, took the skin off and kept the skull. Two doc, three doctors are going to come into this courtroom and they're going to tell you that their opinion is that Jeffrey Dahmer suffers from a mental disorder and it is called paraphilia. Without my trying to be a doctor and defining it for you, except generally, paraphilia is an arousal of a sexual nature to an inanimate object, a body part, or a process. And this paraphilia there's all kinds of paraphilias. And the doctors are going to tell you about the different kinds of paraphilias. But the paraphilia that best exemplifies the paraphilia that Jeffrey Dahmer had, which they will claim is, in their opinion, a mental disorder, which they will state in Jeffrey Dahmer was a mental disease, their paraphilia that they found was necrophilia. Let's bring in our guest joining me now in New York City, collector of serial killer memorabilia, Dr. David Adamovich in Los Angeles, California, forensic psychiatrist, trial expert witness and columnist of Inside the Criminal Mind, Dr. Carol Lieberman, and in Jacksonville, Alabama, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, former senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office and the host of the incredibly popular Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan is with us. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming tonight. Um, Joseph Scott Morgan, let me start with you. Uh, you've been at so many death scenes. Have you ever come across anything remotely close to what we are talking about tonight, which is Jeffrey Dahmer? No. No, I've, I've worked one case of cannibalism throughout my entire career. But I will say this. I was good friends with some of the principals 
uh, with the Milwaukee County ME's office and friends in particular with Jeff Jensen, who was the chief ME at that particular time. And they did yeoman's work. Uh, if you can imagine, Milwaukee County is not a huge shop by our standards when we think about large urban areas. If you go down the road to Cook County, this sort of thing. So the sheer volume of what they had to deal with and process was just absolutely overwhelming. And of course, I've heard all of the stories over the years about what they had to contend with relative to trying to determine cause of death and certainly, I think, to a greater degree, identification. And it was it was quite the task that they had placed upon them at that time. Dr. Carol Lieberman, let me ask you about what we heard there. This is from the trial in the opening statement, paraphilia, necrophilia. How common is that? And, and how... Where does that come from? How does that get inside someone's mind? Well, there are lots of different types of paraphilias, um, but certainly necrophilia, the being sexually um, excited by dead bodies and wanting to have sex with dead bodies as Jeffrey Dahmer did. Um, that is fortunately not very common. Um, it comes from, uh, you know, all as all psychological problems come from uh, comes from their childhood and uh, Jeffrey Dahmer had a really interesting childhood in that um, he was very much neglected abandoned his father was a chemist and he worked you know was workaholic and worked away from the home a lot of hours and his mother I think she was probably a borderline and she was very demanding of attention she didn't give much attention to him and then when his little brother was born she you know whatever attention there was she gave to the little brother so one of the things that Jeffrey Dahmer has said was that he wanted to part of why he wanted to eat these people uh, his his victims was he wanted to he wanted someone to stay with him first of all he wanted he he wanted to have somebody's company and the way that you know before he started necrophilia he he drugged the his victims and so on he was trying to keep them with him he wanted that company he wanted that attention and you know obviously he took it to uh much greater lengths absolutely dr david adamovich um i understand you have some letters connected to jeffrey dahmer um uh, what 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 are they and what sort of insight um, do they reveal? Well, actually, in front of me, I have a letter from Jeffrey Dahmer to my friend Richie. And it's clear in this letter at this time, it was it was dated March 94, which would have been uh, uh, like eight. I think he died in uh, was it November? When was he? Yeah, remember? it was November of 94. Yeah. So just eight months before that. And this is a letter. Would you like me to read this little signature? Sure, paragraph? absolutely. Okay. So it clearly shows Jeffrey Dahmer didn't change very much in prison. Uh, I'd like to get to know you better, but with all of the mail that I get, it's difficult to know who I should respond to. So in your next letter, would you please send me some really good photos to help make your letter stand out in the crowd? You said that you're a bodybuilder. That's good. I'd like to see every unclothed muscular inch of you. I'm allowed to keep any type of photo except Polaroids. So don't take the pictures with a Polaroid camera, okay? Sign Jeffrey. Unreal. So, yeah, and I also have letters <coughs> from uh, Christopher Scarver, the one who clobbered and murdered uh, Jeffrey. And in, in these letters and in the... Um, the incident report from the prison, it's clear that this appears to have been a setup. And that was also I've evident in the Netflix series when you see the guard walk out of the gym and leave Jeffrey in there with um, Christopher Scarver and, and one other inmate. So in these letters, Scarver is talking about um, that he believes he's acting from God. And also in the incident report, you hear um, two inmates referring to uh, they knew the Dahmer incident was going to happen. And one in inmate had said, you've got to get me out of here. And Sergeant Grimmett speculates in the report that perhaps Mr. Rogers is aware of something regarding the Dahmer incident. Wow. So yeah, that's an interesting, you know, side of this whole thing. 
once Dahmer was in prison, which of course independent of everything yeah. he did to get there. And that is Jeffrey Dahmer right there. No death penalty, but there was a death penalty because it happened uh, a few years into his incarceration. Uh, Joseph Scott Morgan, when when you think of what he actually did and you start mm -hmm. looking at how these victims suffered, this, this is some of, and, I, and at the top of the show, I said, this is one of the, like, I talk about notorious criminals through the years. This has mm -hmm. got to be one of the sickest of them all. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is. Uh, the path that he, that he left behind him his wake, if you will, and so much destruction. And, you know, and uh, like with a lot of these serial offenders, there's, uh, I hate to use the term growth, but there, there's a trajectory uh, from this kind of infancy that they have when they begin to perpetrate these crimes to more of a sophistication as they move along. Of course, they wind up getting careless. It seems like that's kind of the, uh, kind of the thread that runs through a lot of this and, you know, where he's planning, you know, the first one, of course, when he was a teen in Ohio was a very spontaneous kind of event, but you have these events where he begins luring people and then it escalates to where he's using drugs in order to, you know, uh, cer certainly knock them out, but maybe loosen them up, lessen inhibitions and this sort of thing. And then you get to this kind of this idea of quote unquote, this zombie uh, state that he wanted to put them in. And the fact that he could even begin to imagine these things give you, gives you an idea, I think, how dark it is. And, of course, you know, not being a psychiatrist, but being a person that observes the end of what has been wrought, um, it's certainly horrific. And it was certainly horrific for those individuals that were out there. I, I, you know, I can't say definitively, but I can tell you that there were certainly scars that were left. Uh, on on those groups of people that had to endure this, that bore witness to it, because you know, as we say in death investigation, we're always having to, you know, assess the abnormal in the context of the normal. It's not something uh, that you expect to see when you walk into an apartment, now, is it? Absolutely not. When we come back, we're going to take a look at some of the testimony from the survivor. Of Jeffrey Dahm, the in one Bismarck, who escaped. North Dakota, Nikki Ensel on trial, accused of cheating on her husband and plotting his murder with the man she was having an affair with. Prosecutors getting ready to wrap their case. We are live in North Dakota with the latest. The way that things were laid out in the room, the location of, of Mr. Ensel, the location of the shotgun, and then the, the multiple injuries to his body, um, we, we were not convinced it was a suicide at that point. It was a holiday parade that quickly turned tragic. Evil has arrived and it's shown what it can do. Darrell Brooks is accused of killing six people when he drove his vehicle through a crowd of spectators. In a surprising move, Brooks waived his right to an attorney and instead will be representing himself. Our cameras will be inside the courtroom as a community searches for justice. The deadly parade crash trial. Live coverage begins this week following jury selection, only on Court TV. Care. I turn my I turn to the right like the fist tank is here. I'm turning all the way over here. You yeah. turn to your right to look at it? To look at the fist tank, right. And when that happens, what happens to you? Uh, all of a sudden, a handcuff and a knife is pulled on me. Yeah. Handcuff is placed on your body? Where? Uh, on my left wrist. And you see a knife? Yeah, the knife, yeah. What'd you yeah. do? What'd you say to him? I asked him what the problem was, you know, that it's not necessary to do this, you know. What'd he say? Uh, he told me at that point if I wouldn't do what he said, he would kill me, yeah. What did you do when you got in the bedroom as he's holding on to the cuff and the knife? What did you do? Well, I'm studying us talking, trying to be friends with him, you but know. Did you remain standing? Did you sit down? Oh, or? he made me sit down at that point. We both sit on the bed. Was it at the foot of the bed, side of the bed, head uh, of the bed? Maybe halfway between. Did that room have a TV set in it? Yes. Was there anything going on on the TV? Yeah, the Exorcist movies was playing at that time. Did you observe him watching the movie and how he would react to the movie? Right, he would like to start rocking back and forth when he, you know, certain parts of the movie or whatever. You have to say, what did he say, Madam? It was like chanting at certain times and rocking back and forth, right? Tell us about his chanting. What was that all about? Uh, I'm not even sure, sir, but it was just like 
I can't tell you the words. I couldn't understand what he was saying at that time. Can you mimic him? How it sounded? It was like a slow slur, like mm, some of that nature, some close like that. I'm not sure. Okay, did you and he move off of the bed at any time? Yes, he wanted me to lay flat down, stomach down on the floor at that time. Okay, now, um, but tell us, tell us, uh, did he still have the knife out? Yes, he still had the knife out. And what did you do? Okay, I kind of like laid on my sides for some reason. I guess God told me not to lay flat down or let this person handcuff me, so I didn't. So you were trying to stop that from happening, but you right. got down on the floor. Right. What did he do? He kind of laid across me, put his head across my chest at that point. What was he doing with his head? Pardon me? What did it appear to you he was doing with his head? What was he trying to do? Like he was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. He survived. He survived. That's how Jeffrey Dahmer got caught. Um, let's bring back in our guest, Dr. David Adamovich, collector of serial killer memorabilia, Dr. Carol Lieberman, forensic psychiatrist, Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, death investigator, Body Bags podcast. Uh, Dr. Carol Lieberman, um, he survived. He's, he's had a, a really, really difficult time uh, with the rest of, of his life. I don't even know if folks know where he is, Tracy Edwards, these days, but... Um, that whole scene, he's laying down, saying, I'm going to eat your heart. Um, unthinkable. Yes. Um, you know, and, and to try to have the presence of mind to figure out what to do or say to, to get out of it. You know, Jeffrey has had this keen sense of picking his victims. You know, he knew uh, who he could lure back to his apartment. Um, and, you know, I, uh, obviously here he, he picked someone who he didn't realize that this man was going to be able to, to escape. But, um, but that's a big part of it, you know. And, and yes, what do you do? What do you, how do you feel when you hear someone's telling you, I'm going to eat your heart? Um, you know, that, of course, that's terrifying. And, and he must have survivor's guilt, you know, with this Netflix playing and so on. And the victims are, are you know, are, are unhappy about it. But. Uh, he would be unhappy about it, too, because it brings back all this survivor guilt. Dr. David Adamovich, uh, let me ask you, have you watched the series? Yes, I did. All 10 one-hour episodes of it. And, you know, knowing what you know from the insight you've gotten from the items that you've been able to collect, what's, what's your take on the series? I think it was very accurate and uh, very interesting, very intriguing, and for someone who's just getting into Dahmer and trying to learn a little more about him, watching those 10 hours, you're really going to learn a lot. Joseph Scott Morgan, you, your thoughts about, I don't know if you've seen the series uh, either. Um, I don't even know if you watch series like that. Uh, Joe, tell, tell me your thoughts. Yeah, I'm more of a comedy guy myself. <laughs> I, it's kind of a busman's holiday for me. I, I will say, commenting directly to the, the issue with Dahmer in, in this case, uh, it was a watershed moment in forensics, I think. It, that coupled with other things that happened back during that time period, it kind of changed the landscape for us and the way we dealt with things. There was almost a seemingly escalation and level of violence that we were having to interpret out on scenes. And of course, back at the autopsy suites, we saw some of the most ghastly things. And it's like, it's almost as if Dahmer for that period of time uh, was kind of, uh, you know, that point uh, that we can look back on and everything is measured before and after Dahmer, I think to a great degree uh, from our perspective in forensics and certainly in the medical legal death investigation world, because it did prove one thing. It proved the fact that you do not have to be in some kind of massive metropolis for something of this level and horror to happen. We, we suddenly had a wake-up call that this kind of horrific thing uh, can occur, and we need to be prepared for it, just like our colleagues up in Milwaukee were faced with that reality at that moment in time. That's before the days of where we had groups of people uh, that could come in and, and lend a hand, really. I mean, people would, but it wasn't at the level of organization that it is today. And that's what makes this a watershed moment, I think, in forensics. And, and certainly it's something that we can learn from and that we have learned from. Um, you know, I can't say that we can prevent it. The, uh, these things, it has to do with psychopathology and that sort of thing. But I think that in the future, we're gonna be better prepared for it because of this. 
Big thank you, Joseph Scott Morgan, Dr. Carol Learman, and Dr. David Adamovich. Appreciate your time tonight. We'll see you again really soon. Thank you.